thank you very much for the introduction and thanks a lot for uh, the invitation and giving me the opportunity to present my work here. And uh, today uh, I will talk about the correlated diagonal balance motion and the uh, fluctuation around the circular law. Everything I will uh, discuss today is about joint work with Laszlo Erdos and Noni Schroeder. And please feel free to interrupt at any moment if something is unclear or if you have any questions about uh, what I'm saying. So, Firstly, I start introducing the model we'll talk today about today. So, for throughout the talk by X, I will denote a non-Hermitian matrix, which has independent identical distributed entries that could be the real or complex random variables. And we assume that the entries are distributed according to a random variable chi uh, with a n to the minus one half scaling factor. And I will shortly comment on the choice of this uh, of this scaling. On chi, we assume that is a center random variable uh, with unique variance. And on top of this, in the complex case, we also assume that the expectation of chi square is equal to zero. Uh, I throughout the talk, I just assumed uh, this assumption just for uh, make the presentation clearer. But this can be easily relaxed. And lastly, we also assume that uh, all the moments of chi are, are bound. In particular, under this uh, normalization, this n to the minus one half, this guarantees that typically, as the size of the matrix uh, goes to infinity, the norm of x is typically order than one. So that was the, the model. And here, I just uh, plot the eigenvalues of a 50 by 50 matrix. That in the left hand side is the spectrum for a, with a, of a matrix with real entries. And on the right hand side, uh, the case when the entries are complex. So here you can already see that uh, a first um, interesting feature of the, um, the real case is that the spectrum is symmetric with respect to the real axis. So each eigenvalue comes in pair. And this I will also comment a bit uh, later on this stuff. That also shows up in our results. And then as uh, the size of the matrix is increasing, you can see that the eigenvalues tend to be basically uniformly distributed over the unit disk. And this phenomenon is the so, uh, called circular law. So that is the convergence of the empirical distribution of the eigenvalues uh, or to the uniform distribution over the unit disk. Then since we have n eigenvalues on a order one uh, set, the, the typical distance between uh, uh, closed eigenvalues is uh, proportional to n to the minus one half. And before um, going on, like I want to uh, focus once more on the um, on the real case, on the spectrum in the real case. Uh, as you can see from this picture, there is an accumulation of about square root of n eigenvalues on the on the real axis. So now I just uh, formalize uh, what the what is the, the circular law. So here by f, we just denote a um, nice uh, test function. And sigma are the eigenvalues of, the, of our non admission metric set. And to analyze the spectrum, one looks at the linear statistics. So this is the sum over all the, eigen, uh, the eigenvalues of f sigma i. And then to make this object an order one uh, quantity, we scale by, by 1 over n. And then what the circular law States is that as the size of the matrix goes to infinity, so as n goes to infinity, then these linear statistics uh, after the one over n rescaling converge to a deterministic quantity that is given by the integral of f over the unit disk. What I want to stress about this uh, convergence, uh, convergence result is the speed of convergence. So, uh, you can neglect this n to the epsilon since epsilon is a tiny positive number, so it's basically negligible. And so neglecting this term, the convergence uh, is uh, one over n. The speed of convergence is one over n. So this is, um, tells us that the fluctuation uh, of the, the linear statistics around this deterministic quantity happens on a order one over n scale. And this is a much, much smaller than one, uh, what one would expect from a usual central limit theorem because one would expect that the fluctuation about the deterministic, this deterministic term would be over there, uh, one over square root of n. 
so much bigger. And, and in this case, um, instead we get uh, one over n is a consequence of the uh, strong correlation of the of the eigenvalue. The proof of such a result goes back to Girko and by, and then it was uh, proven un under optimal moment condition by Tao and Wu. And more recently, there have been uh, many additional uh, results that extended the circular law either to uh, metoscopy scale, so to here the test function f, it was just a function that lives uh, on an order one scale, but one can ask a similar question when f is supported in a smaller set. So any scale that is much bigger than n to the minus one half, in fact, n to the minus one half is the level spacing of the eigenvalue. And uh, so such a result, concentration result for uh, metoscopic test function down to the optimal metoscopic scale, has been proven in a series of paper by Burjad, uh, Yao, and Yin, both in the bulk of the spectrum and at the edge, so close to the unit circle. And um, more recently, this has also been extended to more general matrices, so allowing an inhomogeneous variance profile or even some uh, correlation structure between the entries. So here is uh, just a, a picture to show uh, this phenomenon that um, the, fluctu the eigenvalues fluctuate on a um, much smaller scale. So on the left hand side, you can see the fluctuation of uh, 1000 uh, eigenvalue of ID metrics. On the right hand side, this said that the case of independent points uniformly distributed over the unit disk. And to draw uh, this graph, so one looks at the empirical distribution of the points and then takes this difference with the uniform distribution over the unit disk and then compute its convolution with a smooth uh, bump function supporting a smooth disk and then translate it around and get this uh, fluctuation picture. So now I wanted to state which is the um, uh, main result that we discussed today and I will uh, first uh, discuss present the complex case and then in the next slide I will explain which are the Required changes changes for the in the real case. So here f is just a h two plus epsilon test function, and then we look at the central linear statistic that here I denote by ln of f that is the, the, defined as follows. So here note that I remove the one over n scaling. So uh, ln of f consists of a difference of two order n quantities because uh, the sum mission is over all the eigenvalues and f is typically order one. So this is an order n quantity and also its expectation. But still, uh, as I just uh, mentioned, uh, this happens to be, uh, to be an order one random variable. Indeed, we proved that this central linear statistics converge to a central Gaussian random variable, which has the, the following variance. So the variance here consists of three different terms. So there is a bulk term that is given by the L2 norm square of the gradient of F. Then there is a boundary term and then an additional term that depends on the fourth cumulant of the entry. And uh, similarly, uh, we also compute the sub leading order correction to the circular law. Uh, that is like we compute the expectation of this quantity and then the at leading order is an order and uh, quantity. And as predicted by the circular law, the, is given by the integral of f over the unit disk. But then we compute an order one uh, correction uh, that also depend on the, on the fourth cumulant. And uh, before uh, moving to the real case, I just uh, want to comment on the previous results uh, in, uh, in this direction. So the question to analyzing the fluctuation around the circular law goes back to Forrester. In 1999, when uh, he proved um, the Gaussianity of linear statistics for Geneb matrices, so for lunar mission matrices where the entities are Gaussian random variables and radial set functions. And uh, in, in this paper, uh, Forrester also predicted the explicit formula of the variance for Geneb matrices. So he predicted that for Geneb matrices, and say C1 test function, the variance consists of the sum of these two terms. And lately, this uh, result has been um, uh, generalized in two different directions. So either for um, 
gener uh, generic uh, IID matches for so with generic and distribution, but only for an analytic test function. Or for uh, GDP matches, but uh, C1 test function. And I just want to comment that in this uh, paper by Ryder and Virag, they also uh, interpret this uh, fluctuation as a projection of the Gaussian free field over the unit system. And lastly, uh, one can uh, prove a similar result for matches that match the first four moments with the Gaussian one. And using the four moment matching method developed by Tao and Wu. Um, and finally, uh, I, I want to stress that the dependence on the fourth cumulant, it was uh, previously unknown before our work. And uh, this is because, uh, of course, like for um, GNIB matches or matches that are close enough to GNIB in terms of moments, um, this term uh, is not there because kappa 4 is just zero. But interestingly, also for analytic test function, um, we're, we're not able to detect these two terms because the, even if kappa 4 is non zero, these coefficients happen to be zero for analytic test function. So, this is uh, everything I wanted to mention about the complex case. And now I state the, the real case. So, the statement is, is pretty much the same. Uh, so the, the convergence statement, just the variance look a bit different. Particularly depends on this uh, symmetrization of F. So yeah, P, P S of S is just the symmetrization of F with respect to the real axis. And actually, this is exactly the quantity that one would expect to appear in the variance, because as I mentioned at the beginning of the talk, in the real case, there is this uh, symmetry in the spectrum. Uh, with respect to the real axis. And also in the real case, we compute the sub leading order correction to the um, circular law. And again, there are the, these first two black terms that are exactly the same that appear in the, um, in the complex case. But in addition, in the real case, there are uh, four uh, other terms that uh, uh, order one term that appears. And also in this case, I want to mention the previous results. So uh, central limit theorem for IID matches, but for analytic test function has uh, been proven by Orurk and Renfrew. But they prove just the CLT and compute the variance. They didn't compute the subleading order correction to the expectation. And again, a similar result can be obtained using the formal and matching method, also in the real case. And here I want to uh, conclude the statement of the, real, the, the theorem in the real case, saying that uh, these four uh, terms here in orange were not explicitly known um, even for GNIB matrices. I mean, of course, like for uh, GNIB matrices, the um, explicit uh, uh, density of both complex and real eigenvalues is known, but the asymptotic in, the, in N, the expansion for large N is uh, quite small. So these terms were not explicitly computed. So far, I always mention like um, I want to clarify what's the, the main difference between the results for uh, genome matches and for the generic case. So when the entries are just uh, ID random variables. So in the, um, the K point correlation functions for uh, complex GNIB matrices is, uh, has been computed by GNIB in the 60s and it's uh, fairly simple. So it's a determinantal and the kernel is given by the following formula. And a similar uh, formula but much more complicated is also uh, been obtained for the real case uh, much more recently. He said in, in our case, so when the entries are uh, ID random variable that are not necessarily Gaussian, we cannot rely on uh, explicit formula. And so we have to compute and prove the Gaussianity directly. Now, before moving to the um, second part of the talk, when I discuss a bit the uh, ideas and the technique that we use in the proof of these results, I just want to summarize. Uh, some uh, central limit theorem in both for Hermitian uh, matches and uh, for uh, non-Hermitian ones. 
So here, uh, start with the mission case, and in this table, like, horizontally, is divided accordingly to the distribution of the entries. So if the fourth cumulant is zero or uh, or not, and vertically, this is um, divided according to the regularity of the test function. So you, you can see that about 20 years ago, this has been the SAS central limit theorems have been proven for um, complex analytic or real analytic test function. And more recently, after uh, some uh, partial uh, results, um, has been proven for generic test function and the best results up to date is from Soto and Wong when they prove a uh, Gaussianity of the linear statistics for H1 plus H on test function. And uh, now in this uh, other table, I uh, say similarly, I say the results that I already discussed uh, before for uh, central limit theorems for uh, linear statistics of non Hermitian eigenvalues. The table is divided in a similar fashion. So uh, there's the case when the entries are Gaussian uh, horizontally, and the case when kappa 4 is zero, and the general case when kappa 4 is non zero. And again, vertically, uh, we divide the results into according to the regularity of S, so for complex analytic test function and for generic test function. For uh, complex analytic, <coughs> analytic test function in a uh, order one neighborhood of the disk, so say in, uh, that uh, this test function are uh, analytic in a disk of radius four, uh, the central limit theorem has been proven both in the complex and real case. And the big advantage of the analyzing complex, uh, analytic test function is that uh, one has a integral uh, representation, contour integral representation of the linear statistics on an order one, um, order one away from the um, unit disk. So everything is stable and one can look at the non admission resolution directly. But this is not uh, possible uh, for generic test function, as you said, and the analysis is much more uh, involved. And uh, as I mentioned, this um, such as CLT has been uh, first proven for uh, Gini matrix, so for matrices that have uh, Gaussian entries, and then um, for matrices that are not uh, Gini but closing up in the sense the first four moments are the same. And lastly, after um, this uh, partial uh, results, we proved the um, central limit theorem for H2 plus epsilon test function in both the complex and the real case. So now I will uh, move to the proof strategy and uh, to that try to explain uh, some ideas. And now, I mean, if you have any question about the result of what I presented so far, these are good moments to ask before I move into a bit more detail. Okay, then if it's not the case, I will move with the proof uh, strategy. So be before going into the details of the proof, I want to compare the how one would uh, you would like to prove a central limit theorem for emission matrices and or uh, and non-emission matrices. So first here I start with the emission matrices. That is uh, that I will denote by H and will denote the emission eigenvalues by lambda i. And using Alfred Jostan formula, one can uh, write uh, linear statistics as the following integral, where G is the resolvent of the Hermitian matrix H, and uh, F tilde is an almost analytic extension of F. And here I uh, recorded a, a bound uh, of this directional derivative of the F tilde when the imaginary part of W is small. And I will shortly comment why this is uh, the fundamental feature of uh, Alpha Jostan uh, formula. In the non-admission case, uh, as I mentioned in the previous slide, the resolvent is very unstable, so it's basically useless. Unless uh, F is analytic, because as I said, one can uh, integrate F over a contour that is order one away from the spectrum, so everything becomes stable again. And on, he said to overcome this problem, we rely on uh, Giscos formula which is an integral representation of the linear statistics um, that depends on uh, two uh, special parameters that here are denoted by eta and by g. Here gz is just the resolvent of uh, hz 
that is the so-called hermetization of X uh, around the point D. That is the following uh, two by two block matrix that is zero on the diagonal and X minus G, X minus G star on the off-diagonal block. So uh, now I want to explain what is the, the main difference uh, between these uh, two uh, words and why the non hermitian cases are there. So the key feature of Elfer's Law sum formula, so for Hermitian matrix, is that one can trade in the regularity of the test function f with a poorer control uh, of uh, the resolvent for small, uh, for better parameters with a small imaginary part. Indeed, assume that one wants to understand, wants to prove a central limit theorem for uh, f that is support an order one set on macroscopic test function, then using this bound on the derivative of the F tilde. One needs a control on the resolvent only for um, imaginary part of W that is approximately order one. Instead, this is, this is not the case for non hermitian matrices, since, as you can see from this interrepresentation, we need to understand the resolvent for any eta, also for very, very small eta close to zero. And because so far there is not known way to trade in the regularity in the G integration, so in the F, the regularity of F, with a poorer control of the resolvent for small eta. That's uh, what makes the non hermitian case much harder because even if we just want to uh, understand the um, spectrum on a macroscopic level, so for F that is uh, for the order one set, we still need uh, microscopic information on the resolvent on the eigenvalue. So now, uh, as I said, uh, we rely on Girkos formula. So I just, using Girkos formula, I just uh, wrote the, uh, the following integral representation for the linear, central linear statistics. And to understand the distribution of them, we compute the, the moment. And here I want to uh, mention again that if the first four moments of the entries match the, the Gaussian moments, then one can directly compare the distribution of the resolvent with the, its uh, Genib counterpart, and then use the fact that in, for Genib matrices, the k point, the correlation function are explicitly known, and then one can uh, prove the Gaussianity by explicit computation. But in our case, without the matching moment assumption, we, we need to prove the normality of the linear statistics directly. And more precisely, we will first uh, prove a weak pairing and then we will compute the explicitly the variance. Here, I, I just uh, want to recall once more that um, the LN, uh, the linear statistics, is a difference of two order n quantities, but uh, this happens to be an order one quantity. So first of all, we have to gain back our one over n to get this order one uh, term. And to do so, we will use a uh, optimal local law for the trace of the of the resultant that I will show you uh, now. So the local law for the resolvent OG states that um, trace of the resolvent is a very close to its uh, expectation in, in the following sense. So the, the error term is one over eta. And now I will, in the next slide, I will show you that if we plug this info back in um, Girkos formula, then we get a bound that is almost order one. And here I just want to mention that in Girkos formula, we need information only uh, on the imaginary axis. But uh, in the real case, we need such a local law also for uh, W that is uh, a general spectral parameter in the, uh, in the spectrum. But I will not say anything more about this. And uh, in the statement of the local law, I said that the trace of the resolvent is close to its expectation. And the expectation can be um, explicitly computed. And is given by this MG of W that is again a two by two block matrix. That is a solution of a matrix that's on equation. In, in our particular case, since the um, entries of the matrix are uh, IID, then the Dyson equation reduces to a scalar equation. So all the information about the 
the capital M can be uh, understood using the small m that is a solution of this uh, fairly simple uh, scalarization. In order to uh, compute the subliving order correction to the circular law, we, it's not enough just to say that the expectation of the resolvent is close to this M, but we need uh, to compute the one over N uh, subliving correction here uh, as well to then uh, compute this uh, correction to the circular law. So, um, as I said, we will uh, want to understand distribution of the linear statistics computing uh, its moments. And now uh, we can see that using the optimal uh, local law, we have an almost correct a priori bound. Uh, that is, um, that indeed, if we plug in the, um, this bound, we get one over eta, that then after integration gives uh, basically log n contribution. And so we can see that um, any moment is bounded by n to the psi, where psi is a tiny exponent. So we are almost at the correct order. I mean, here it is a bit because the integration is from uh, zero to infinity, so one over eta will not be iterable, but this is uh, the very uh, small regime close to zero and the um, regime very for very large eta close to infinity can be easily removed at the price of a negligible error. Here you may notice that I split the integral into three different regimes. This is because each one of these regimes will be analyzed using different techniques. So the very small data regime, so I mean uh, much smaller than n to the minus one, uh, we will show that uh, this regime uh, is, uh, doesn't contribute to the answer to the order one contribution. Indeed, this, purple, uh, this orange regime um, will be analyzed using smoothing inequalities and will prove that it's uh, small as n to the minus, say, 1 over 100, some small exponent. Similarly, uh, we also prove that this green regime, that is the macroscop macroscopic regime, so when eta is close to uh, n to the minus 1, uh, we will also prove that it's negligible, um, proving that uh, the trace of the resolvent uh, is a different spectral parameter z uh, uh, are independent. So we will I will show you in a few slides that the trace of gz1 times the trace of gz2, if g1 and g2 are necessarily away from each other, then these are uh, asymptotically independent. And lastly, we will show that the main contribution, so the order one leading term contribution comes from this uh, purple regime. And uh, in particular, I yeah, will prove a central limit theorem uh, for resolvent, and then we'll plug back the answer in Gisco's formula and compute the answer. And now I will uh, say a few words about each one of uh, these regimes, and I will start with the resolvent uh, CLT, so with the order one contribution. One can see that by like, computing i moments of uh, Gisco's formula, we end up in uh, understanding the expectation of product of traces of resolvents. And first of all, we prove a uh, weak pairing so that the leading order contribution is given by the expectation of only the product of two traces, and everything else is uh, lower order. And now yeah, we will just write the answer in the complex case. The real case is uh, similar, but a bit more complicated. So I will just uh, focus on the complex case. And one can see that the expectation of the product of two traces is given uh, by the following two terms. So a two-body term Vij and um, another term that is the product of two one-body term Ui, Uj. That is the one that depends on the force cumulant kappa force. Here, uh, one can see that the um, Vij and Ui can be explicitly computed by the solution of the Dyson equation. Here, I wrote the explicit formula, but uh, the exact formula uh, doesn't matter. It's not uh, relevant for you, but what, it's, uh, what I want to, the message I want to give in this slide is that to give a heuristic idea of how one gets the L2 norm square of the gradient. And indeed, like if we take just two points, Zui and Zj, that are well inside the unit disk, then the one can explicitly compute the integral of this uh, eta integral of the Vij, and the integral is given by the log of the difference of the two. So 
in two dimensions, you can think of the log as uh, one over Laplacian. So after we plug back this uh, in uh, Girkos formula, we are left with this quadratic form that is the one over Laplacian sandwich with uh, between two Laplacian of S. So you can heuristically think that one Laplace, Laplacian cancel and then we are left with the S one over square over S. And in, to prove such result, we uh, rely on the cumulant expansion that uh, here I wrote the expansion in the case of a real unknown variable, but uh, can be generalized also for, to a complex one. And uh, in particular, um, as I showed in the previous slide, we are interested at the G, at the trace of G minus this expectation that one can see that using the equation for M and can be expressed in the, in the following way. So the G minus expectation is given by M W G, where uh, W is the following two by two block matrix. There's zero on the diagonal and that sets are in the off diagonal block. And then, Using the cumulant expansion for the resolvent, one uh, sees that the expectation of the product of traces is given by the trace of the product of the solvent and deterministic matrix A and B. So here A and B are just uh, two by two block constant matrix that uh, deterministic that depends on the M, but the their explicit form doesn't matter. So the the main message of the, this equality is, is to convince you that uh, to un, uh, understand the expectation of the product of traces, we need to understand uh, the trace of product of resolvent at different special parameters. And this is a major um, difficulty compared to the um, Hermitian case because in, in the Hermitian case, there will be just no blocks. So you can think A and B just being uh, scalar matrices. So they can go out from the space. And then we are left with G1, G2. That using the solvent identity can be written as uh, in the following way. So we go back to a, a single resolvent problem. And one can rely on a usual single G local load. In, in, in our case, we said, even if we assume that A and B were not there and we just look at G1 uh, times G2, then there is no uh, uh, such a reduction available to go uh, to reduce a two G problem to a single G problem. And here, the main difficulty really comes from the fact that the special parameter G1 and G2 uh, are different. So that's what it makes uh, harder than the mission case. So this is uh, just uh, the sketch that I want to give you about the dispersal regime, about the resolvent central limit theorem. And next, I want to focus on the microscopic regimes on the uh, asymptotic independence in, in the green regime. So again, uh, we compute the um, moments of Virchow's um, formula and. Uh, for simplicity, we just look at the, at the second moment and we want to prove that it's more like an inverse power of n. Of course, to, to prove uh, such a bound, it's enough to uh, prove that if uh, we look at uh, etas that are close to n to the minus one in the following sense, and z1 minus z2 are uh, well separated from each other, then the resolvents are uh, asymptotically independent in the following sense. So that the expectation of the product of traces is given by the product of the expectation plus a small error. In principle, uh, to prove such a result, it seems that the, so the trace of the resolvent involves all the uh, eigenvalues, but the one uh, can notice that actually the main contribution to this to the trace of the resolvent actually comes only from the smallest uh, eigenvalues, the one close to zero, because um, because the, this eta over lambda square plus eta square is an approximate delta function of scale eta, and here lambda and g are uh, the singular value of x minus g that are also the absolute value of the eigenvalues of x minus g. So using this observation. We actually con conclude that uh, to prove our result, it's sufficient to prove that uh, if we take Z1 and Z2 away from each other, 
then the um, uh, corresponding singular values are asymptotically uh, independent. The, and here are the lambda one, lambda k, where k is n to the minus epsilon, then of the smallest uh, singular value, the one close to zero. And without loss of generality, we can assume that x uh, has a small Gaussian component because then this Gaussian component can be easily remove, removed by a simple perturbation argument, also known as uh, GFT, Green Function Comparison Theorem. And here, the small Gaussian component is just proportional to n to the minus one half. So square root of t, where t is uh, uh, just a bit bigger than n to the minus one. So to, uh, we add the, the small Gaussian component in the following way. So we first look at the following matrix flow, where B of s is just a, a matrix valued uh, Brownian motion. So it's a non Hermitian uh, matrix, and then these are just standard uh, high ideal Brownian motions. And again, for simplicity, I will uh, focus on the complex case. And later, at the end of the talk, I will just uh, show you a slide what is uh, comparing it with the real case, which are the main difficult, additional difficulties in the real case. So we start with the metric flow, but then we want to look at the singular value flow. And by fairly easy computation, one can see that if x is a solution of uh, this uh, SD, then the, its singular value are um, a solution of this Dyson Brownian motion flow. So here, the B, uh, I, Z are just, uh, just a family of standard real Brownian motion, and U and D are the lesser right singular vector of X minus Z. But as I said before, like um, we are interested not only at the singular value for a fixed z, but we want to look at the correlation for different z1 and z2. For this purpose, we compute the quadratic variation covariation of the of this diving Brownian motion, and we see that the, this correlation is given by the product of the singular vector overlap. So just uh, a comment about uh, what we learned so far here is that for uh, the good news is that for a fixed Z, the Dyson Brownian motion looks like the usual Hermitian uh, Dyson Brownian motion. But um, for different Z, we have uh, an extra non trivial correlation that depends on the singular vector. Instead, for fixed Z, the flow depends only on the singular value, not singular vector. And this will not be the case anymore for uh, real matrices. When uh, even for the fixed Z, uh, the um, flow depends on the singular vector. And I will uh, show you this um, few slides. So I just wrote again the flow to summarize this and uh, wrote the correlation. So to prove the asymptotical independence, we want to prove that this correlation is actually, is actually small. And indeed, uh, what we can show is that if Z1 and Z2 again are uh, away from each other, then these uh, overlaps are small. And to prove this, we again rely on the local law for product of the solvent <coughs> of uh, a different spectral parameter. So for example, here I just wrote uh, in spectral decomposition, uh, the product of imaginary part at Z1 and imaginary part Z2. And one can easily see that it's uh, given by the following formula. And then uh, if we compute the trace, you can see that in the right-hand side, we get exactly this overlap. So here, uh, the V overlap and here the U overlap. And then using the local law, we have an upper bound on the product of the, of the trace of the product of the solvents and this uh, using this uh, relation uh, becomes an upper bound also on the um, singular vector overlap. So in this way, using uh, the again the local law for product of resolvents, we manage to show that the correlation is uh, is small. Um, so in particular, here I just uh, rewrote the flows uh, the the flow for two different z1. And Z2, and I um, just uh, wrote here again what is the, the correlation so that it is small. And now I'll show you uh, by animation that uh, under uh, um, this hypothesis, so using that this correlation is small, we can prove that 
the smallest singular value are asymptotically independent if the one and the two are uh, away from each other. So what you uh, see in this animation, like in the top part, uh, the gray dots are the evolution of the non-Hermitian eigenvalue under the DBM. And these colored dots, like the orange, the green, and the purple one, represent the Gs. So you can see that the Z1 is the orange dot, and the Z2 is either the green or the purple one. So the interesting thing you can see here is that if Z1 and Z2 are close to each other, so for example, if the Z1 is the orange dot and Z2 is the green one, then the, the dynamics of the smallest singular value is strongly correlated. They look pretty much the same. On the other hand, if you look at the case when Z1 is the orange dot and uh, Z2 is the purple one, so that they are well separated from each other, then the dynamics are uh, almost independent. They look very, they look very different. And uh, mathematically, we, we proved this uh, result relying on the homogenization theory for the death on Bernard motion that has been developed by Burgade, Dorshaun, Yin, and then extended by Landon Tosoe Yao and adapted to this two by two block structure by Che and Lopato. And in this way, we can prove that after a time that is just a bit bigger than uh, n to the minus one half, the singular value flow forgets the initial conditions and also all the dependencies in the driving Brownian motion. But we just proved that the that this the driving Brownian motion are basically independent, and so this we conclude the asymptotically independent. And here I just want to comment that this is the the first time that uh, we consider um, correlated uh, Brownian motion. Usually in all this uh, work about homogenization theory is considered only a single uh, Brownian motion. And I want to uh, comment on the, the way how we uh, relied on the data on Bernard motion, because usually in, the, in all the proofs of um, Wigner data on uh, meta universality, um, one used the data on Bernard motion to show that the Gaussian ensemble are a strong attractive equilibrium for the dynamics. And that so after adding a tiny Gaussian component, the value distribution is very close to the corresponding Gaussian ones, and then one can compute explicitly the answer from the Gaussian ensemble. In our case, the joint distribution of the singular value at different Z1 and Z2 is not known even for Gaussian case. So as a byproduct of our results, we also proved the independence in the, in the Gaussian case that was not known. And a very interesting uh, thing here would be to prove uh, the independence of this or just to compute the joint distribution directly for Gaussian ensemble. But still using the ergodicity of the Dessenberg motion that forgets the initial conditions, we could prove the um, uh, we could prove the antotical independence. And this is uh, everything, this concludes the, the complex case. And as I said, uh, and now I'll show you in the next slide, the real case is worse because the overlap, this singular vector overlaps influence the dynamics more drastically. So here I, I just wrote again uh, in the top line the, um, how the data and motion looks in the complex case and on the bottom is in, in the real case. And I added in orange in the real case, which are the new terms compared to the complex case, where these thetas are uh, the following uh, singular vector overlap. Um, so there are two main differences. So the, the first one is that even for fixed Z, in the real case, there are these orange terms that appear both in the kernel and in the correlation of the driving uh, martingale. Indeed, like the, this B, I, Z now are, uh, in the real case, are correlated even for a fixed Z. So the, the driving uh, martingales are not Gaussian anymore. And uh, since this data appears here, it also weakens the level repulsion between the neighboring eigenvalues that was already critical in the complex case, close to zero. And in principle, uh, these two uh, things together could even like jeopardize the well postness of, the, of this process. But uh, in order to deal with it, we just introduce an intermediate process 
where the large uh, values of these uh, orange terms are uh, cut off. And uh, to do so, we uh, this a similar problem already appeared in uh, other work from Che and London, when they also have a similar um, term in the kernel. But uh, in, in that case, the correlation of the the, the driving mapping is were still done in motion. So this is everything I wanted to say about the real case and in general about the, these two regimes about the asymptotic independence. And uh, so um, this concludes um, what I want to say about both the purple and the green regime. And lastly, we are left with the orange regime. And uh, one can easily prove that this regime uh, doesn't contribute, relying on smooth inequalities, for example, uh, example by Tao and Wu, that with, high, with fairly high probability, there are no uh, singular values much smaller than n to the minus one. So this concludes uh, the analysis of the old uh, three regimes. And now I just want to conclude with a summary uh, of what we discussed today. So we prove a central limit theorem for uh, higher dimensions, which has either real or compact entries with the general entry distribution and generic set functions. And the main technical steps to achieve these results were a local law for products of resolvent and different spectral parameter, a central limit theorem for resolvent and the proof of the asymptotic independence of uh, singular values using the Black Combinian motion. And this is everything I wanted to say today, and thank you very much for the attention. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, so we can uh, clap for now, <laughs> and thank you. Okay, so um, do you have questions uh, to, to the audience uh, or comments? I have a question. Is that it? Yes, I love the thanks for the very nice talk. And uh, I was wondering, uh, I, I did not get why uh, in this uh, middle term you needed the, uh, the width of the eta to go around one over n for this. Uh, I'm, I mean, you, you have these three terms, and one is really a, a, around one over n. Yes. And I was wondering, in your proof, where you use this Dyson Brownian motion, why you need it to be over one over n, or if this could hold in a bigger uh, uh, yes. window? Is a, that is a very good question, and that this comes in like here, because so when we approximate the old trace with just the first n to the epsilon uh, singular values, we use the theta here, it's small, it's 10 to the minus one plus epsilon. And so if, you, if we will take a bigger eta, then we need a bigger upper bound here. And this will mean that to conclude this uh, result, we need to prove the asymptotic independence of the single, smallest singular value where k is something, I don't know, n to the one over 100. But this uh, would not be uh, possible with the DBM because with the DBM you can just control n to the minus epsilon again value, singular values together. You cannot control more. Does this answer? Uh, the com then the complementary question is so the first term usually people get rid of, of it thanks to the uh, estimates on the smallest smallest singular values. So do you improve these estimates to go to one over n or? No, in this case, um, we can to bound this uh, regime from uh, zero to n to the minus one minus epsilon, we can just rely on uh, singular uh, bound on the smallest singular value that are available. We don't need to improve that. Because okay, we just- I know I remember you are right. So we, yeah, I agree. Yeah, thank you very much. Thanks for the question. Do you have other questions? Um, maybe I, I have one. Um, so you mentioned that in the Geneva case, there is a connection with the Gaussian free field. 
Uh, and so in your general case, maybe you mentioned it, but I, do you have also a connection with a, a Gaussian free fit? Uh, uh, right. Yes, so um, in our case, so when we also have uh, Kappa 4 here, um, we can also prove our convergence to the Gaussian free field when uh, Kappa 4 is, is positive. So uh, it, Kappa 4 is, is positive, is a positive number. So if okay. Kappa 4 is bigger or equal than zero, then we can uh, show that um, that the CSD can be interpreted as a projection of the Gaussian free field plus uh, another term that depends on the square root of kappa 4 that is just um, average operator over the this minus the boundary. Okay, okay. That's but for if kappa 4 is negative, then we don't have any interpretation for such a slip up. So why intuitively, why do you need kappa 4? Well, I mean, it's just because uh, yeah, I mean, you, you can see this kappa 4 as a, in the Gaussian free field, you can see the kappa 4 as the variance of a Gaussian random variable, basically, but if it's negative, then there is no such interpretation. Okay, thank you. Thanks for the question. Uh, other questions? So if no, so we can thank you again. So thank you very much for your nice talk.